you run out of options real fast. Very quickly, yes, that, and that's a good point, Joe. That I must say that's that's a very good point. Your options, they they are limiting your options. They're forcing you to go with their providers. But why are they doing that? Is it because they care so deeply about the welfare of your family? No, you know why? They're centralizing the records. They are centralizing the 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 one sixth of the economy of the United States. They are centralizing. See, in order to control something, you need to centralize it. And once they do that, they've got you by the you know what's. Um, they do, and this is the change that Obama, this communist in chief, has been talking about, because centralization equals communism, and you can't have a new world order, which is the ultimate objective, without, without, that control. without that control. That's right. And a new banking order. And folks, get ready. Get ready, because you will see a one world governance come into play. And oh, it's just not Obama. Don't forget George W. or H.W. Bush talking about talking about uh, the New World Order on September 11th, 1990. And also, don't forget the thousand points of light. Remember, oh, that feel-good thousand points of light. Who, no. who, where do you think that came from? from Madame Lovatsky. That's just one of yeah. the cult most, yeah, the, the, well-known the satanists, uh, satanists and occultists that right. people today still uh, look up to read their material, her material, his material, whatever it is, and uh, follow that. And actually, the Pope said something this weekend that I agree with very much. He said, Pope, the Pope attacks global economics for worshipping the God of money. Pope Francis made one of his strongest attacks on the global economic system on Sunday, saying it could no longer be based on a God called money and urged the unemployed to fight for work. And this is what people worship. And it's not just people part of this new world order. It is many people. Uh, a, a god of money and anything that, that comes with that. You could be talking about supplies uh, that could be seen as money. You know, guns, ammo, food, gas. It's all mechanisms of control. You can't have, and as Glenn Beck talked about, the centralization of power. They've centralized the healthcare industry, they've centralized the economic the economies of the world. They centralized That's right. farming industries. Uh, everything is and, central. And, and look, part of that was education, the common core. Yeah. Common core, it's, it's all upside down and backwards. By the way, I just got an email from, uh, I'll just say your first name in your city and state. Ken from Rochester, New York, all active military members and ex-military members have been notified by... USAA Bank and Wells Fargo of a notice of a shutdown October 1st, 2013. Uh, Obama is planning a shutdown of the government. I heard not that the... 30, wait, wait a minute. 380,000 foreign troops on U.S. soil with training completed October 1st. Foreign troops to be used for home inspections under Obamacare and gun confiscation. I don't. We know about that, the home inspections. Look, uh, seriously, okay. We know that they're, they're oh, home that inspections. Oh, that would be such a bad idea. I mean, we we went over, um, and I can find the, I save all the articles that we talk about. Yes, I will find yes. the um, home inspection, the Obamacare home inspection articles. By the way, we've got five terabytes, folks, in this studio right now. Five terabytes, imagine that, of data that we've been collecting since... The first of May of twenty, or the fifth of May of twenty twelve. So, j just to give you an idea, but you say you you say we have articles, or we we've, we've got open source information. Yes. Wow. Okay. Well, well, uh, thanks, Ken, yeah. for that. Uh, but but I, I got to tell you, I don't believe. <laughs> okay. That I I just I I cannot see this taking place. Forced home inspections by government agents, part of an Obamacare provision. Oh, that would get ugly. And these are, this was reported in August, after August 20th. Uh, this started to come out in the news. And we have about two minutes before break. But Zero Hedge, we'll get back to the home inspections after 
we talk with Mark Mitchell in the second hour. All right. 17 trillion U.S. national debt. Try 211 trillion. This from Zero Hedge. 211 yep. trillion. It says the U.S. national debt continues to surge higher every day. I guess did it uh, start rising after what was it, the hundred and some days where it stayed at that <laughs> it was consistent stuck. level? Right. Yeah, right. but the uh, it says it will soon surpass the 17 trillion dollar mark. Standard & Poor's reduced the U.S. credit rating from AAA to AA. It was the first time the U.S. ever suffered a downgrade to its credit rating. The S&P took its action despite the plan Congress passed last week to raise the debt limit. Downgra the downgrade, S&P said, reflects our option that the f fiscal consolidation plan that Congress and the administration recently agreed falls short of what, in our view, would be necessary to stabilize the government's medium-term debt dynamics. Now, just last week, Obama said that the passing the debt limit would not or does not constitute uh, more actual debt being added to the national debt. Which is totally nonsensical. I, I mean, Raising the debt ceiling does not increase our debt, is what he said. Right. Though which it has is, over 100 times in history. What he's saying, and think of, think of it this way you've got a credit card and you raise your credit limit, but you don't spend any more. Right. Does that, does that raise your debt? No. But technically, if you spend no. More, it does. If you spend more, and, and which, but so what's the sense, however, of raising your credit card limit if you don't intend to spend or charge more? Just in case. Just yeah. in case, Just right? In case. And and what has history shown us? Every time, every time it, it's been raised, there has been historically, as pointed out in this article, historically, every time it's been raised, the debt has been raised. So it's a really nonsensical, disingenuous statement. Folks, you're listening to the Hagman Hagman Report. On this, the 23rd day of September 2013, I'm an angry Doug Hagman. Not really, not really. I'm just uh, fired up here tonight talking about the is issues. Uh, we're in studio here with me as Joe Hagman. Together, we are the Hagman and Hagman Report. Your watchman on the wall. Coming up, Mark Mitchell. Stay with us. We're right back. Hi folks, Doug Hagman here. You might know me as the co-host from the Hagman and Hagman Report or as a frequent guest on Coast to Coast AM with George Norrie. If you're like me, you're tired and confused over today's headlines. You just don't know where to turn for accurate, concise information about really what's going on, what's truly going on in today's society. If you don't know where to turn for accurate, well-researched, and properly vetted news, I've got a suggestion. In fact, it's a requirement. Bookmark Canada Free Press. That's CanadaFreePress.com on the Internet. It's just not for Canada. It's for news across the world. Judy McLeod, founding editor, has put together a vast array of talented writers like Kelly O'Connell, Daniel Greenfield, Dr. Eileen Johnson-Powell, a lot of guest columnists, very talented writers. Folks, that's Canada Free Press at CanadaFreePress.com. Now mobile friendly. Follow on Facebook because without America, there is no free world. Hi, folks. Doug Hagman here for AmericanSurvivalWholesale.com. That's AmericanSurvivalWholesale.com. Folks, get ready. Please get ready. You know, people ask, I, I get emails all the time what's coming? When's it coming? How bad is it going to be? Uh, I, I should have something like, I don't know, soon, bad. <laughs> that would be my response. Folks, get, get prepared. Have your families. Prepare your families, even if you've got to do it in the background. I understand. A lot of people understand. A lot of people in your shoes. But American Survival Wholesale has got a tremendous bone or a tremendous uh, uh, bonus package for us, but please listen carefully because there there seems to be a little bit of a misunderstanding here, and I want to clear this up. Right now, American Survival Wholesale is offering, and, and this is something I I I'm really promoting because I believe in it. Currently, American Survival Wholesale is promoting one month emergency food supply by Linden Farms plus. As a bonus, you receive a free Hagman and Hagman just-in-case kit, and you receive free shipping. 
Now, the, the shipping on this, it's costly. It's like 40 bucks. Now, I mean, it's costly. Shipping is costly. Trust me on this. It's just not American Star. I mean, it's everywhere. However, folks, please pay attention to this. Listeners will not receive free shipping if they attempt to order more than one at any given time. Or if you add additional products to your cart when you're taking advantage of this offer. Well, you might say, well, huh? Well, it, it's the way the software is set up. It's the way that this, this commerce software is set up. So please, in order to take advantage, and, and listen to me carefully, in order to take advantage of this offer, which I really highly recommend you do, especially before it's gone, it's a $360 cost the retail is closer to 500 with shipping would be well over $500 but your cost is $360 you cannot buy this cheaper anywhere or less expensive anywhere and the quality of the food it's the Cadillac it's the Cadillac of freeze dried food so here's the deal one month emergency food supply by Linden Farms with the bonus of a Hagman and Hagman just in case kit and free shipping, but here's the here's the situation: stop the order right there, complete that order, go, go back, and you can order more under different uh, you know through through a different uh, transaction. But the way the software is set up, it won't allow you the free shipping if you add to that particular promotion. Hopefully, that'll clear things up. But at any rate, AmericanSurvivalWholesale.com, my favorite place on the Internet to go shopping for preparedness item, items for food. That's AmericanSurvivalWholesale.com. i got to tell you something. Email them if you have any questions whatsoever. Their email is on their website. That's AmericanSurvivalWholesale.com. Bill, Obama. And his health care plan is dead on arrival in the Senate. The Affordable Care Act has been the law of the land for four years now. Democrats are willing to work with reasonable Republicans to improve this law. But we will now understand that there's an anarchy movement that's afoot. A uh, lead editorial in the New York Times Wednesday of last week said that. But we're not going to bow to Tea Party anarchists who deny the mere fact that Obama is what the Obamacare is the law. We will not bow to Tea Party anarchists who refuse to accept the Supreme Court rule of Obamacare to be constitutional. And we will not bow to Tea Party anarchists in the House or in the Senate who ignore the fact that President Obama was overwhelmingly reelected a few months ago. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to hour number two of the Hagman and Hagman Report this Monday, September 23rd, 2013. We're going to call our guest for this hour, Mr. Mark Mitchell, right now. So you will this hear is the, the, Yeah, this is the beauty of live radio. Now listen to this. You can hear the phone ringing. The tension is building. Can we have, <laughs> can we have background music, please? We'll watch, we'll get her an answer. Hello. All right, there we go. Uh, folks, it is our pleasure. It is our pleasure to welcome Mr. Mark Mitchell. Folks, if you don't, if you've never heard of Mark Mitchell before, you're, you're gonna you're gonna know who he is tonight. Mark Mitchell is an incredible man. He was an editorial page writer for the Wall Street Journal, correspondent for the Far Eastern Economic Review, and the chief business correspondent for Time Magazine in Asia. That's just for starters. Mark Mitchell is with us, joining us now live. Hello, Mark. You're on the Hagman and Hagman Report. All right, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Well, I'll tell you what, it's, uh, it's, it's great that you could come on get relatively short notice, but uh, uh, Mr. Mitchell, we're glad to have you, and uh, I've been, uh, I, I'm, I'm a fan of your work. I've, uh, you are now associated with a website 
if I if I can say this, it's a deep capture. Uh, am I correct on that? Uh, deep, deep capture. That's doctor? right. Yes. All right. That's right. All right. Well, that's where you 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 kind of went underground there for a little bit and came came up and you're now the you're now a reporter or uh, one of the primary reporters, I believe, right for Deep Capture. Is is that right, your that's, okay? Good. Uh, okay. That's my day job now. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, well, Mr. Mitchell, welcome to the Hagman and Hagman Report. I'm Doug Hagman. Of course, with me is Joe Hagman, and uh, uh, we are so proud to have you. Again, I followed your work. You are a tremendous in- investigative journalist, folks. Uh, here's a real deal. This is a guy who uh, who, who really uh, gets to the root of things. Mr. Mitchell, why don't you <sighs> t- t- tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you got out of the mainstream media circus, I suppose. We'll start there. <laughs> well, um, it's, it's a long story, but um, the end of the story uh, occurred after I was at the Wall Street Journal, and after Time Magazine, I went to uh, work at Columbia University. Uh, their school of journalism has a uh, publication called the Columbia Journalism Review. And... Um, while I was working there, uh, people started coming to me with a story basically suggesting that a small group of journalists had completely monopolized the coverage of a, an issue um, uh, related to the financial system and uh, uh, a form of trading on Wall Street that, that uh, posed a threat to the financial system. And, and so I started to look at into that, and I, you know, I, w- I was a, I started as a skeptic, thinking, well, it's unlikely that a small group of journalists could really control the message entirely on a given subject. But um, looking into it more and more, um, it became apparent that there were, in fact, um, what I now call uh, captured journalists. Is a, um, I mean, there's really no other way to put it other than there was a, a cabal of journalists and. Um, and a group of people on Wall Street who were telling them what what to write. And um, they fully monopolized the coverage uh, in in all of the mainstream media on this particular issue. It was an issue um, called naked short selling, which is a complicated issue, but the basic idea is that um, uh, hedge funds and Wall Street banks were attacking uh, entrepreneurial public companies um, using a variety of methods to drive down their stock prices and force them into bankruptcy for profit. Okay, now, now we and, haven't talked. Okay, we, we haven't, uh, uh, Mr. Mister, we have not talked before the show. I'm looking at an 80 page PDF file here. It, 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 does this encapsulate, is this what you're referencing, this 80 page? Um, uh, uh, PDF file. It's about uh, well, it's a serialized. It's a forty-eight thousand word story um, about a network of market miscreants that includes dis- disreputable financial analysts, prominent journalists, and some. I- is this part of this, or is this something different? Um, yes, I think that's it. I've, I've written a couple of uh, eighty-page okay. stories about the same subject, but the. Um, but that is one of them. Um, I think it was called the story of deep capture. Exactly. And right. Okay. Um, and, that, and it, that that tells the story. Is is this a public document? Uh, in other words, I'm looking at. Or yes, is this, you can find okay. that uh, at deepcapture.com. Okay, because it, it is really a 15 chapter story published as a single document, and um, it, it it's an incredible doc. I mean, I read it before the before the program, and, and holy cow! I got to tell you, uh, you talk about uh, some insightful information, folks. We'll make that uh, we'll provide a link on our website directly to that document, so you can read the investigative work of of Mr. Mitchell. But uh, so, okay, so you realize that that you are not really your own man, huh? Is that the is well that, um, the I started to have suspicions along those lines earlier when I was at the Wall Street Journal, and um, and this learning about this 
story that um, is told in the story of Deep Capture uh, really kind of blew it wide open for me where it occurred to me that actually the um, the media is, as they say, largely controlled by a relatively small group of people and different groups of people depending on the issue, but um, it became apparent to me that this was the case not only with uh, the issue I was looking at while at Columbia, but also on other issues. Mm. And so, we're, we're we're being most of America who thinks that they're watching the news. Whether I mean, if it's on uh, NBC, ABC, CBS, MSNBC, Fox, that's eh, all dog and pony show, isn't it? It is. It is. And um, the I mean, it it uh, I don't want to make it sound like it's a, a grand conspiracy, but it is to some extent a, a conspiracy in in the old line is control the message and um, that's what uh, people do whether it's the White House or or uh, <coughs> or Wall Street or any other self-interested group they, okay. they control what, what ends up in the media well it's kind of interesting and I'll share this with you back in 2008 uh, I believe it was in December we broke this uh, Canada Free Press uh, Judy McLeod and I broke the story. In August of 2008, we had a, uh, or I had a, a, a very prominent radio talk show host come to me. And because I'm an investigator by profession, he spoke to me in my capacity as an investigator, not a journalist. So, and he did that very, very intelligently. He did that for a reason, knowing that I could not say anything, I mean, kind of like a doctor, patient, lawyer, client privilege type situation. So I couldn't say anything. Uh, but what he did was he supplied me with a, with a written statement saying, you know what, uh, uh, my editor, my, uh, uh, not my editor, the, the guy that the uh, producer said that I was not allowed to talk about the Chicago Tribune's coverage of the eligibility of Barack Hussein Obama as president. Now, it, it wasn't about the eligibility. It was about the press coverage of the eligibility that he was not allowed to talk about. And I was just astounded by that, uh, by the, the fact that this man who would be a household name to anyone you know, with a pulse that listens to radio would would be captured like that. Uh, I, I, I and it still astounds me. Right, right. <sighs> it, it, it's it's um, the way it works is is all journalists are are not captured, but it's sort of like uh, if you if you live in with a tribe in the Amazon jungle and everybody wears a loincloth and you just kind of go along and wear a loincloth as well, and mm -hmm. Um, so most journalists, maybe on some sub subconscious level, they do understand that what they're writing is not true, but um, most of them are, are basically in a trance and they don't quite realize it. Mm. But there are a small number of people within the media who are wittingly captured and um, serving the interests of people outside the media. And okay. um, they wield a lot of influence over the other journalists who work for the big news organizations. Well, and I'm, I'm going to offer you. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I don't mean to talk over you. I'm going to offer to you. No. You you can absolutely say anything uh, that you want to. You can disclose whatever you want. You could talk about whoever you want um, on, on our program. Uh, you can go as far as you wish to go. There are no restrictions on anything that you want to say so if you want to name names if you want to talk about uh, specific situations you're you're encouraged to do so but but i guess at this point i, I would just ask you to, to take us where you th you know what's most important on your mind and what should you and joe and i be talking about to our listening audience tonight what what what's important for us to to, to really go over tonight with with the three of us here 
Well, I think it's um, very important for people to understand that what they read in the in the major newspapers and what they see on the major news networks um, is is often um, what it comes down to is party line propaganda that's um, uh, created and it's come down to a science that it, that it's created in such a way um, to deceive the public on a lot of different issues. And um, I, I can cite multiple examples of, of uh, things that I wrote while I was at the Wall Street Journal, for example. Um, well, well, go ahead and cite the, one. Go ahead and cite one thing that, that that kind of sticks in your mind that's pretty memorable for you. Yeah. One thing that sticks in my mind is I was... I was based in Europe, and I was responsible for writing most of the editorials in the Wall Street Journal about um, the Kosovo Liberation Army in the Balkans. And in 1999, uh, President Clinton ordered the military to go to war in the Balkans in support of the Kosovo Liberation Army, which was then fighting uh, the Serbian government of uh, Slobodan Milosevic. And the party line that was delivered to me was that Milosevic had engaged in genocide and the Kosovo Liberation Army was essentially a band of noble freedom fighters that wanted nothing more than independence from Serbia. But, um, and that's the party line that I wrote. And um, I knew some facts that were differing from that, but... Um, at the same time, there, there was tremendous pressure to to write kind of what the party line was. And the truth um, was actually that the Kosovo Liberation Army had been established by Osama bin Laden and company. And um, that's, you know, since been, it's, it's since been, it's now of, of information that's available in the public record, but not not yet in the Wall Street Journal. And so in 1999, President Clinton essentially ordered the U.S. military to go to war in support of an organization that had been established by al-Qaeda. Wow. Some <clears> things <throat> have never change, do they? <laughs> right. And <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it just continues to this day. And, um, and the mechanism whereby that the party line that ends up in the Wall Street Journal um, ignores important facts like that is that they have an you know editorial board of um, very august and prominent people um, connected to Washington and to Wall Street, and they sort of sit around and decide what the party line is going to be. And then they tell their reporters and editorial page writers what it is, and they, the editorial page writers and the journalists get to work and write it. <laughs> and uh, and um, it, it's also gotten to the point where, um, and this may be deliberate to some extent, that the there are far fewer journalists working on far more stories than before. And the journalists just don't have the time to know whether what they're writing is true or not. And it, 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 could you have gotten away? I, I'm just curious uh, because I, I'd be the type of guy that would be doing this. I, I, I would probably get fired. Uh, you, you know, uh, uh, could, could you get away with writing something or slipping something by, uh, you know, your your editors that would be contrary to what they'd want? published you couldn't do that could you in other words you you get uh, smacked down they wouldn't put you it would in get smacked down you could do it sometimes so um for example once i i got a story in the wall street journal about what was happening in in the congo which was different from the party line and um it got in because the editor who worked on the story um wasn't really familiar with what was going on in Congo and didn't um, know what the party line was supposed to be. <laughs> and after the story came out, I, I did get in trouble for it. So, <laughs> uh, wow. Okay. So, so you, you, if 
you can maybe once in a while slip something by people, it, it, depending on the level of complexity, their knowledge, and, and other factors. How long were you with the journal, uh, Wall Street Journal? How long were you an editorial writer? Uh, about three years. Okay. All right. Would you do it again? What's that? Would you do it again, given the chance? Given the chance, would you go back and um, do, it, do it again? I mean, I would love to see if I, knowing what I know now, knowing how that how it works, um, I would love to go back and see if I, if I could um, try to to reform the system a little bit. But it may be beyond re- redemption. <laughs> wow. It's, um, wow. No, 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 do, do, go ahead, Joe. Yeah, uh, you made a statement earlier about the level of propaganda that the mainstream media uses. Um, from your experience from dealing with people inside of this country versus outside of the country, how much uh, how, the propaganda used in America, I, I've been told this by many different people, that Americans you know, don't get really any real news about what's going on in the world. Uh, the news is watered down, and we know that there are now... You know, behavioral psychologists learning how to shape the news and shape opinion through the news rather than giving people the truth. Has that been Ab- increasing? Absolutely. And have you ever had an editor, um, you know, ask you to switch the way you were to word things or to publish things in order to play into that shaping? Yeah, shaping the news. Yeah, it's, um it's never stated explicitly, and um, the it, it. I mean, this goes back many years. I, I think the, uh, Edward Bernays is sort of the grandfather of public relations, and um, and since then, it's it's gotten down to really a, a science where the people who know what they want in, in the in the media um, know how to craft the message and know how to deliver it to a journalist in a way that. Makes mm. the job of the journalist easier, and it just writes whatever he's given. The um, but uh, in terms of the difference between the media that we have here in the United States and say Pravda in the Soviet Union is that at least the people in the Soviet Union understood that Pravda was propaganda. And here, I I have a colleague who likes to say that the pretense of liberty is worse than, is the worst form of tyranny. Mm. And there's some truth to that. It's, um, there's a pretense that we have a a free press in this country. And, um, the truth is, uh, we don't have a free press in the sense of a press that is investigating the messages that are being delivered to it by, um, by people on Wall Street and people in Washington, and uh, we don't have a free press that questions um, party lines and uh, thinks for itself. It's um, it's it's now um, really the case where the press is fully controlled by a, a relatively small number of people who decide what what appears in that. In, in the press. And who, who, who would you say controls the press? I mean, is it, the, is it the, the party in power, or is it a bipartisan group, or is it an international group? I mean, if you were to say, okay, I mean... Um, or is it com- compartmentalized yeah. through that structure? Um, yeah. Well, um, no, I mean, I think it's, it's, it is bipartisan, uh, there's um, there are differences between between the, the parties, and sometimes they have different messages that they want to get out, and so you do see um, opposing messages between, say, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party in the press. But um, <clears throat> actually, if you start examining the differences in the stories that are coming from the Republicans and coming from the Democrats, they are essentially advancing the same party lines, though from different angles. Hmm. And, um, I mean, I, I can tell you when, we was, when I was at the Wall Street Journal, um, uh, one of the people who sat on the journal's editorial board was Michael Milken, and he was previously 
the most powerful man on Wall Street and um, went to jail for a couple of years in the early 90s, came out and uh, completely changed the story of what had happened in the 80s when he had <laughs> essentially looted a lot of savings and loan banks and caused a massive financial crisis to now he's you know, a, a hero of Wall Street who innovated all of these great financial products. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that was the message that ended up in the Wall Street Journal, simply because he sat on the board of the editorial uh, page and because he um, was friends with the people that ran the paper and they kind of got together and decided this was going to be the message. And, mm. and, uh, and so, you know, one of the messages that came out of that was that he was the hero for having innovated collateral, collateralized debt obligations. <laughs> which are one of the, one of the instruments that destroyed the economy again in 2008. But oh, weapons of financial destruction. Uh, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Glorified as, innovations by the wall street journal up until 2008 so. wow man well joe and i were talking here um what do you think of the uh the this this uh one thing we talked about last week was the media shield law joe what what, what we we had some things to say about that i think 48 states in the dc have their own media shield laws where you don't have to turn over your sources now the the, the um, attempts are to pass a federal media shield law. I don't see anything good coming from that. Do you? Um, well, I, I think it's important for, for journalists to have uh, sources that are protected. And, um, but, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I, and I'm not sure that identifying the sources would eliminate the problem of Sources delivering to journalists party lines, but um, <laughs> but it's an interesting question. The uh, I think that's less damaging than the than the latest attempt to classify who qualifies as a journalist. Basically, it's yeah. Let, let's talk. Doesn't. Yeah, let's talk about that because uh, it, it seems to me that that is an attempt to. Screw with the uh, First Amendment of everybody. If you're a blogger and you write a blog and you happen to, maybe your brother-in-law works uh, works somewhere and you and you know you just you're lucky and you get a scoop and you write about it and all of a sudden hey you know you're you're famous or infamous whatever the case may be. Um, but but let's talk about that. Uh, who who does classify or who should be classified as a journalist? What what are your thoughts on on this discussion? I think everybody should be classified to be a journalist. We, um, there's no uh, special. Uh, I mean, it, it's not like accounting where you where you learn a specific skill set and take a test, and you know, then you're an accountant. It's um, can you write a clear story, and can you investigate, and can you find out information that's useful to the public? And if you can do that, you should be allowed to, to present that information. <clears throat> so I, I think anybody should be a journalist, but the um, it's already now um, the situation is that only certain journalists, for example, are allowed into White House press conferences, and they choose who's going to be the White House press corps, and that um, automatically guarantees that they won't have anybody asking difficult questions at White House press conferences, and, and it, that's the case. I mean, if you um, watch a White House press conference take place, you'll notice that no, no journalist in, the, in those press conferences ever uh, asks an embarrassing or difficult question. It's, it's, they're, you know, they're softball questions that um, at most uh, require a clever answer. But um, have, have you been on the inside of one of those... Have you been on the inside of that? Um, we'll say, what is that? The, uh, the the press room in the White House. Have you been on the inside of that? And I haven't been in in the press room at the White House, but you know, I've I've watched them on C-SPAN and so forth, and I 
we've been in similar press conferences and press rooms in in Europe, and <clears throat> it's a similar uh, situation. So it's, it's uh, all choreographed. It's uh, the questions are choreographed, pretty much. The well, the um, the choreograph choreograph may be too strong a word, but they the journalists know that they if they want to have continued access, there are only certain questions they can ask, and they won't ask other questions mm. that um, will put them in bad favor with with the people who control the message okay well yeah i i guess we should expect this as uh, and and i look at our audience our listening audience is perhaps a cut above everyone else's listening audience joe i think you agree with that uh yeah you know, people, our audience is, is is pretty intelligent we could tell when we're you know we're we're getting snowed and when we're not uh speaking of snow Snowden, uh, what, what are your thoughts on the NSA, Snowden, that whole affair taking place there? Do you have any particular thoughts on that? Well, um, it's, it's difficult to say. I, I, it does seem like, um, as is usual, the full story hasn't been reported in, in the mainstream press and um, stories that have come out elsewhere. Um, are uh, not necessarily written by people that know specifically what happened, but um, the, the theory that that he was uh, um, had his message carefully crafted and delivered to the media, I think, is not an outlandish theory. I think and, um, he delivered some important information, but there's something called a limited hangout where they. Uh, will um, recognize something as a potential scandal and preempt it by by uh, reporting certain parts of the scandal, but not the full scandal. And um, it's, you know, I, I don't, I, I think that Snowden delivered some important information and people should take it to heart and believe what he says, but... Uh, I also suspect that that's not the full story, and um, and the full story, if you think about it, it, is really what we have is an um, NSA that is not just you know looking at random people's emails, but looking at everything, including you know what goes on on Wall Street, and that that gives them access to all kinds of inside information that can be traded on and. Um, and uh, create huge black budgets for use and things that uh, we might not necessarily want them used for. And there's a whole larger component to that story that um, I think hasn't hasn't been reported. Yeah, there is uh, many questions I have surrounding Snowden and what he has released, uh, how it was released, and <clears throat> would he even be able to get that information out to the public uh, the, in the way he did, knowing the restrictions and the uh, limits that they put on uh, people who work in those industries to make sure that, you know they have safe proof uh, or f ways that you know they guard against you even taking paper clips or extra pieces of paper to flash drives out of those buildings and uh, right. an example that was given to me was you know working at the treasury, you get weighed before you go in and when you come out and uh, you get searched, and it, it just seems a uh, too easy the way he said he obtained the information, then disseminated it to the public. But um, and by the way, I, I like your use of the phrase "limited hangout," and folks, listeners, understand that limited hangout is a uh, propaganda technique. What it is, it involves a uh, release of previously hidden information in order to prevent a greater exposure of more important details kind of kind of like um the saying well you know releasing the lesser of the worst what well, lesser of the of, of a worse uh, truth i suppose so th that's a very interesting concept yeah. relative to snowden uh, mr mitchell for people who are in school and, and just coming out of school studying journalism um, what advice would you give them as far as how to 
go about uh, making their careers, if they want to be investigative journalists, if they really want to report the truth, would you say that they should go, you think they should go work at um, some of the more, what the administration and the party line people would call reputable places of employment and journalism for the experience? Or would you say that they should uh, stay away from those and, uh, you know, start their own media outlet? Would they be better off, uh, you know, going there to see how the real snake and journalism, the snakes and journalism work uh, before going to start their own? Or do you think they'd be better off just going right out there and, and doing their own thing? Well, I, I would love to send an army of enlightened people to infiltrate the major news organizations and, and just cause trouble if, I, if that were a possibility. But <laughs> yeah. I would say that um, it's if you're working for a major news organization, you're not going to be able to do the kind of investigative journalism that you, you imagine you might want to do. Um, they simply don't do that kind of journalism anymore. And uh, so, you know, the, the best you could do is go in hoping to get, uh, to, to get a little bit of the truth out. And um, there's definitely advantages to working for one of those news organizations and that you have a, you know, a captive audience. But, but um, if you really wanted to... Uh, Expose the truth. I would say, do it on your own. I mean, I've um, in the time I've been away from the mainstream media, I've enjoyed myself much more than I did before, and I've written things that I never could have written before. And um, there's uh, there's uh, a lot to be said for being able to do that. Right. And I do think that there's. Um, I mean, the, as much as we complain about the the public being under the spell of the mainstream media, I think that there is a genuine revolution underway where um, people are starting to get their information from other sources. And um, I think where we're at the stage now is we have a, a, a massive population of people that have information that's different from what's reported in the mainstream press. And they believe that that information is true, but at the same time, belief is a little bit different from certainty, so they're still sort of waiting for uh, it to appear in the New York Times, and then they'll be certain that, it, that, that what they thought was true. I understand kind that. Of yeah, it's a normalcy bias, isn't it? Uh, I guess people have. We could report on the on, on bad news, for example, and I'm not sure. As a journalist, you'd have to grade us to how are we doing? You know, as a news outlet, I'd like to know that. But I think you guys are doing great. I mean, I'm, I'm a huge fan of what you do, and uh, it's. Um, well, thanks. <laughs> okay, people like you are. are Really making a, a big difference, but okay. Well, let me ask you this now. Um, uh, actually, uh, yeah, I was, I was fishing for compliments. Thanks. I'll, I'll send you a check <laughs> out for that. Uh, and coming from you, uh, Mr. Mitchell, that, that, that is indeed a compliment, given your background, given your history. What are you working on now? What, what's what's on your radar right now? What's the what should Americans? Or even the world be looking at right this moment, uh, or, or what, what? What are you working on? Even if those two things are not consistent with with each other, what uh, what should we be looking at? What should we be talking about? What should well, we be? I'm, uh, I'm I'm working on what started to be a story about um, the risk of terrorist organizations and organized crime syndicates and so forth using. The, uh, manipulating the financial markets, and really? wow. um, and and out of that, the uh, the further I went down the rabbit hole, what uh, was um, what I came up with is that all of these terrorist 
terrorist organizations that go by different names, they're all essentially controlled by the Muslim Brotherhood. And the Muslim Brotherhood is not just a political organization, it's a massive financial empire. And um, very much connected with the financial empires on Wall Street. Really? And Right, so they control huge banks, um, some of the biggest banks in the world actually, all of which have joint venture financial institutions with the major investment houses and brokerages on Wall Street. And so I started looking at that, and, and it, it started as, well, yeah, actually, the, there are terrorist organizations or the Muslim Brotherhood are manipulating the U.S. markets, but they're doing so um, in league with their partners on Wall Street. Wow. And okay. Now, now, now this. Pre- uh, wow. I got a ton of questions on this. Obviously, Obama, the Obama regime, uh, Hillary Clinton with Huma Abedin. Uh, or Huma Abedin, depending on how you want to pronounce that. Uh, it seems like this particular regime is is infiltrated by the Muslim Brotherhood, and of course, we're seeing a lot of, um, as in the past, a lot of capitulation to and with Wall Street. Is this part of it? Um, yeah, uh, it's um, it's huh. it's one in the in the same thing. It's um, Wall Street uh, advocating for its most important partners, which is the Muslim Brotherhood, and um, and that is related to the fact that we have all sorts of Muslim brother, Brotherhood figures working in Washington. And um, there's an amazing component to this story. There was a Muslim Brotherhood figure named, uh, a Muslim Brotherhood leader really named uh, Abdurrahman Alamudi. Oh, yeah. And he uh, was, <clears throat> in addition to being a leader of the Muslim Brotherhood, a key figure in Osama bin Laden's organization. And he, during the 90s, actually worked as a top advisor to President Clinton in the White House. And um, then in 2003, he was caught at Heathrow Airport with a suitcase containing $350,000 in cash. And Washington where, where scrambled... Where was that headed for? Where, where is that three hundred and fifty grand headed for? Well, that's where the story gets interesting. Initially, Washington scrambled to, to cover up the story entirely. So they, um, and they did that by crafting a party line and controlling the message and delivering it, as they often do, to the New York Times, which published a front-page story saying that he had received a suitcase full of cash from the Libyan government on orders from Muammar Gaddafi, and that the cash was supposed to finance, uh, and they called him, they didn't say he was with the Muslim Brotherhood or anything, they said he was a Saudi dissident, (laughs) and that the cash was to be used to finance a plot that had been hatched by Gaddafi to assassinate the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. And um, and that Alamudi and these other unnamed Saudi dissidents in London were going to carry out this plot to assassinate the crown prince. Mm. And so I started looking at this because he was also a banker and um, founded a bunch of Muslim Brotherhood financial institutions, and they had partnerships with Citibank and so forth. And so I started taking a look at it from that angle, and ended up looking at um, going back and looking at the court papers from his trial. And it said that he had received the cash from an organization in Libya called the World Islamic Call Society. And this had been um, reported in the New York Times, but the New York Times had carefully changed the name to the Libyan Islamic Call Society describing it as an organ of the Libyan government. But on closer inspection, the world, it, it was from the World Islamic Call Society, and the World Islamic Call Society at that point was leading the opposition to overthrow the Qaddafi regime and had also helped establish the Al-Qaeda affiliate in Libya. 
And this is the same Al-Qaeda affiliate that later became the Arab Spring Rebels in, in Libya. And, um, and sure enough, after Gaddafi was overthrown, Hillary Clinton traveled to Libya spent her entire trip in Libya in the offices of the World Islamic Call Society, singing the praises of their efforts to overthrow the Gaddafi regime and so forth. And so the question then is, well, if he got the suitcase full of cash from the World Islamic Call Society, it definitely was not part of a plot hatched by Gaddafi to assassinate the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. Was there, um, was, and was there a any such plot. And it turned out that when he was in London, he was on his way to meet first, this is in 2003, he was on his way to meet first with Ahmed Chalabi, who was at that time being called the George Washington of Iraq by the Wall Street Journal and, and New York Times and everyone else. <clears throat> and also to meet with an organization oh, in London called... What's that? Uh, sorry about that. I just uh, your characterization, or not your characterization, the characterization, George Washington of of Iraq. I, I just said, "Oh yippee, go on." I, I it was just right. A I mean, George Washington would be rolling over in his grave because this right. is a lobby. He's a he's a financial criminal and a and an oligarch, and uh, <clears throat> he had been indicted in Jordan for busting out a major financial institution in Jordan. I mean, to call him the George Washington of Iraq was incredible. Yeah. And uh, but anyway, so uh, Alamudi was on his way to meet him when he was carrying a suitcase full of cash, and also was on his way to meet this organization called the Movement of Islamic Reform in Arabia, which Washington was then describing as a Saudi dissident organization. But if you go back and look at um, transcripts from the House Task Force on Terrorism from, from prior to 2001, the state very clearly that that organization had been established by Osama bin Laden while he was resident in London and was supported by the Saudi royal family. So, um, but the, but the, when, and when this, when this came out, they simply changed the party line to say, well, yeah, okay, the Saudi dissidents in London, they were actually al-Qaeda operatives, but they, they did want to assassinate the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. Um, but there's a lot of reason to doubt that that's true as well. And there's actually reason to believe that um, the regime in Washington wanted to assassinate the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. In How order crazy to, uh, is this? In order yeah. to replace him with um, somebody who was more amenable to... Uh, to the war in Iraq at that time. And, um, uh, Mr. Mitchell, just let me stop you for a second. Just, just to be clear on this, we're talking about uh, the the same guy, this Alan Moody guy. He, he was an Islamic advisor to, to, to Bill Clinton. He, he was a fundraiser for both parties, the Republicans and Democrats, right? Uh, he, he, he worked with uh, people like Grover Norquist. Um, right. President of Americans for Tax Reform. He was a U.S. citizen uh, starting in 1996. He met with Bush in July of 2000, wanting to repeal or working with the Bush to repeal some of the anti-terrorism laws. He spoke at the National Cathedral um, Prayer Service after the 9/11 attacks. That guy. This is who we're that's, talking about. That's the guy, right? And um, he also ran, he founded an organization in in Washington called the American Muslim uh, Council, and um, very prominent Muslim <coughs> lobbying organization. And uh, after September 11th, the director of the FBI, Robert Mueller, gave a speech at the annual convention of the American Muslim Council, saying that it was the most mainstream Muslim organization in America. That organization was founded by Alan Moody, who, first of all, aside from being a leader of the Muslim Brotherhood, really was a, a key figure in Osama bin Laden's organization. And, um, and aside from that, he founded the American Muslim Council with a, to 
through a, um, a vehicle he used to establish that organization was a financial institution in Saudi Arabia called SEDCO, which um, had uh, been founded by a former BCCI figure named Khalid Sheikh Khalid bin Mahfouz, had um, operated joint venture businesses with Osama bin Laden. <clears throat> and the American Muslim Council had also been used to funnel money from Osama bin Laden to the blind sheikh who was at the center of the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. And so for the director of the FBI to call that organization the most mainstream Muslim organization in America, when he knew full well all of this information, really kind of raises some questions. But. I, I guess so. Um, uh, I got to ask you this: Do you pay someone like your neighbor uh, to start your car every morning? I mean, really? <laughs> yeah, holy cow! Uh, I, you're you're into this labyrinth of of monetary uh, this well financial terrorism and, and buying the souls, buying the spirits, buying the even the allegiance of people in our government. Uh, uh, my goodness, it, it's it's incredible. I mean. To, to, just to work on that, but but to expose this, um, and ha has it gotten exponentially worse under Obama? I mean, to me, look, to me, Obama is a Muslim, whether he's a practicing Muslim or not, he's a Muslim, and that's what I believe. Is this is this whole thing gotten worse under Obama? This whole Islamic, I don't know which what, what you'd call it this gravitation to this Islamic uh, um, well I don't, I don't know that it's um, it's gotten worse the uh, in previous administrations um, from Clinton through the Bush years had similar similar relationships but um, it's gotten to the point now where it's really like what H.G. Uh, Wells called the open conspiracy. I mean, they don't even make a secret of it anymore. That now that you know we want to go to war in Syria to support Al Qaeda. You know, and yeah. If I could, um, the Osama bin Laden story, and uh, this will speak to something you said that people are are really awakening or understanding that the news is is controlled. Um, if you had to to say one way or another the Osama bin Laden story. Do you believe that that was uh, given to the public as it actually happened? Um, do you believe In that the way this it happened. Act actually took place? And then the second part of that question would be, are people waking up to this, to, to the what they're seeing, the propaganda on the news fast enough? I mean, now from the other side of the aisle, <clears throat> it's easy to watch the news and see all the deceptions and all the different angles of why they would uh, you know, use the propaganda the way they do to try to keep people in these party lines and the way that they think. But do you think one the the OBL raid was carried out the way they said they would? And two, do you think people are snapping out of this manipulation fast enough to where they can make a change? All right. Well, uh, in, in answer to your second question, I think people are um, beginning to understand. But it's um, like this. Like I said, they're sort of waiting for it to appear in the New York Times, and that's never going to happen, and they're going to have to um, do their own research and decide for themselves what's true. Um, as far as whether you know the Osama bin Laden raid happened the way it, it did, uh, all I can say about that is um, I think given everything else that we know, we'd have to be completely insane to accept at face value what, what we were told at the press conference by Obama and um, by all the newspapers that did nothing other than take notation at the press conference. So I don't know what happened um, with the with the Osama bin Laden raid, and maybe he was killed then, but maybe not. We, we just don't know. But I, I like I like that, the, uh, I like your thought. You know, we have to be insane to really believe, given what we know. It's it's not us who are the whack jobs right now. It's the other people who believe the official narrative that are the whack jobs, given what we know, right? I mean, that's kind of the way. Right. It is. And the, I mean, the official narrative is that he spent most of his life living in a cave and surrounded by ancient editions of the Koran and 
rusty AK-47 and um, maybe had a, a website that brainwashed people in basements to become jihadis, but that's just not the way it was. This guy was a um, high-level <coughs> Muslim Brotherhood figure, which is the same organization that uh, is known as the most mainstream Muslim organization in America. And um, he was, in addition, um, a very sophisticated financial operator and co-founder of multiple um, banks in, in the Middle East and um, one bank in the United States. And he was a, um, in addition to all that, uh, really an organized crime figure who um, was involved in all kinds of criminal activity. And <clears throat> and he was a scion of one of Saudi Arabia's leading oligarchical families. Okay. Which, con contrary to the party line, did not um, excommunicate him from the family because uh, he had become a terrorist. That simply wasn't true. Uh, the, <laughs> he, uh, he remained in business with his family during as long as he was alive. He operated a major financial institution in partnership with his uh, brother called the Saudi Investment Corporation. And... Um, and it was in multiple other lines of business. Imagine that. We've been lied like to. Wow. <laughs> this is not a guy that was living in a cave, I assure you. Well, uh, Mr. Mitchell, we've got about uh, roughly about two and a half, about two minutes here. Lightning round question from questions from listeners all across the globe. I've gotten, um, if you can just uh, uh, humor me with these questions uh, from Julie Naperville, Illinois, asks... I just lost her email here. Hang on just one second. Uh, okay, uh, here it is. Julie from Naperville, Illinois asks, uh, uh, Mr. Mitchell, your thoughts. Are we headed for war in Syria? Well, I I certainly hope not. That's not a, a war we want. To, and we're already in at war in Syria, actually. And we're providing weapons to those rebels and, um, and uh, all kinds of other support and they wouldn't be fighting at all if it weren't for our help and our allies in the war on terror. Right. Okay. But, um, but you think we're going to see boots on the ground there? Um, no, I'm adding to this question, obviously. You think you're going to see American boots on the ground in Syria at some point in the near future? I think it's very possible that we will. Yeah. Okay. All right. This from John in, uh, looks like, uh, well, we'll say Montana. Uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce that name. Uh, financially, how bad are we in trouble? Do you see an economic collapse here in the United States in the near future? Um, well, nothing has been done to rectify the problems that caused the last crash. And um, so uh, I would say that there's a high likelihood that uh, it will happen again. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. Well, well, Mr. Mitchell, uh, in the remaining the 30 seconds we have, or, or 45 seconds, uh, tell us about your website, where people can read your material, how they can get a hold of you. Just uh, go ahead and plug your work. Uh, well, it's um, called deepcapture.com, and uh, everything that uh, we've been working on for the last couple of years is, is posted up there, and we're working on another um, we, we've tended to do very long investigative reports, um, and they take some uh, effort to get through, but um, they, they contain information that we think is important, and um, we're preparing to publish another, another one uh, in the next uh, week or two. Yeah, you, 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 these are not, by the way, folks, these are not 800-word uh, little snippets of unsighted uh, material. These are investigative reports. So these are real investigative reports that people would be paying money for to read or should be paying money for to read. Seriously. Uh, I admire your work, Mr. Mitchell. You're, you're a tremendous investigative reporter. You've got your facts uh, together. You dig deep. You dig far. You go well down the rabbit trails. 
follow well, like us. We you follow every lead you can until they're exhausted and report the truth. And I want to thank you so much for that. And the web the website again, sir, is deep cover dot com deep exactly. capture or deep capture deep capture I, 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 deep capture i'm sorry about that deep capture dot com mr mitchell thank you so much for spending your monday night with us we really appreciate having you we do hope to have you back on again the invitation is open to you even though you've got a dark history of journalism no <laughs> just uh, it's, it's, seriously it was a it was our distinct pleasure to have you on and we really appreciate your time Absolutely. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you very much for having me. Anytime we'll do it again soon. That was Mark Mitchell. And uh, there's a short notice, but a great interview. And we will have to have Mr. Mitchell back on again. Folks, you're listening to the Hagman and Hagman Report on this September 23rd, Monday edition. And we're going to be taking your calls in the next hour at 6 o'clock. 661-244-9839. That's 661-244-9839. Don't go anywhere. Stay with us for a third and final hour. Hi folks, Doug Hagman here. You might know me as the co-host from the Hagman and Hagman Report or as a frequent guest on Coast to Coast AM with George Norrie. If you're like me, you're tired and confused over today's headlines, you just don't know where to turn for accurate, concise information about really what's going on, what's truly going on in today's society. If you don't know where to turn for accurate, well-researched, and properly vetted news, I've got a suggestion. In fact, it's a requirement. Bookmark Canada Free Press. That's CanadaFreePress.com on the Internet. It's just not for Canada. It's for news across the world. Judy McLeod, founding editor, has put together a vast array of talented writers like Kelly O'Connell, Daniel Greenfield, Dr. Eileen johnson Powell, a lot of guest columnists, very talented writers. Folks, that's Canada Free Press at CanadaFreePress.com. Now mobile-friendly. Follow on Facebook, because without America, there is no free world. Ladies and gentlemen, what have you done to prepare today for what's coming? You know what's coming. What have you done to prepare? Have you gotten an extra can of fruit, extra can of beans, an extra bag of rice, extra bag of flour at the grocery store have you ordered from american survival wholesale.com have you ordered from a freeze dry guy have you done anything today or the past couple of days to get ready for what's coming gotta ask it please do so time is running short one thing about preparedness you can never have enough information at your fingertips folks we are running not we we are just the vessel for what Stan and Holly Dale have created. They've created this marvelous ability, this giveaway. They're giving away 10 copies of Dare to Prepare. That's Dare to Prepare. It's a magnificent preparation book. They're giving away 10 free copies. All you've got to do is go to homelandsecurityus.com. This is exclusive, by the way, to the listeners of the Hagman and Hagman Report. They're doing this for us. But they're doing this for you. Go go to homelandsecurityus.com. Click on the icon, the book. You'll see it on the left hand side of, of of our of our website. Very prominent. Click on that book. It'll explain how to enter into a drawing where you can where you can just enter in the drawing and win a copy, your very own copy of Dare to Prepare. Folks, it's a huge book. It's a heavy book. A lot of information in it. You'll need it. Get it now. And even though you have the opportunity to win it, I would say buy yourself a copy. And the reason I say that is because even if you do win, if you, even if you do win it, um, you can give the you can give the other copy to a family member, a friend, a neighbor, your church, whatever. The information contained in the book is invaluable, folks. That's dare to prepare. Go to homelandsecurityus.com. Click on the icon there. It'll take you to a page where you can see 
very simply see how to enter into the drawing. And while you're there, let's scroll down, visit standeo.com and dare to prepare.com. And even on Stan and Holly's website, they've got a lot of free information about preparation. Free information about preparation. It's valuable. Folks, do it today. And while you're at it, make sure your thoughts are about stocking up on food, stocking up on water, making sure you've got cash on hand, making sure you've got um, when it, when and if the banks close, or if and when, and I believe it's when, not if, the banks close and the ATMs stop working, you've got cash. Do your homework. But above all, enter for your chance to win a free copy of Dare to Prepare. And do it today. Do it for yourself. Do it for your family. But do it today. It's hard to imagine when things are going reasonably well, just how quickly things can change. But what would it take? Economic collapse? Massive crop failure? Chemical or biological attack? So many situations could find you in the grocery looking to pick up food for your family only to find that the shelves are empty. There's nothing. Don't let that happen. Act today to make sure that if it ever comes to that, you and your family will be provided for. Visit FreezeDryGuy.com to look at the wide variety of survival foods available. Freeze-dried foods from the Freeze-Dry Guy store longer, rehydrate faster, are nutritionally superior to, and taste better than any other long-term storage food available. Visit FreezeDryGuy.com or call toll-free 866-404-3663. FreezeDryGuy.com you want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to our third and final hour this Monday, September 23rd, 2013. I just want to let all of you guys know who might have lost your sound or it dropped off that the archive will be unaffected with sound all the way through. And I don't know why sound would be lost for some and not all, but we did not lose our connection here to BTR nor on Cuban. So I can't for the life of me think why people would lose sound, but... The archive will not be affected, and we apologize for any inconveniences that the loss of sound may have brought about. Um, we're going to be taking calls this hour at 661-244-9839. And once again, want to say go to our website at homelandsecurityus.com. Dare to prepare on the left-hand side. Click there for your entrance uh, into your free drawing for one of 10 Dare to Prepare books. That drawing will end on Monday, a week from today, at noon. Also, we will be joined by Stan Deo tomorrow, Paul McGuire on Wednesday, Jerome Corsi on Thursday, and Yoda on Friday for those who have joined us late. And also, go back and listen to our interview with Tom Horn from Friday. It was an excellent show, and hopefully we can do that again soon, but lots of information there. We're going to go to the phones now, and thank you for your patience. For those of you who have been on hold, we're going to go to area code 281 first. You're up now. You're live on the Hagman and Hagman Report. What's on your mind tonight? Hey, Joe. This is Sharon from Texas. Hi, Sharon. Hey, I am concerned and wanted to find out some information. If you all have it, maybe bring it to the attention of others that don't know. On Steve Quell Q Alerts, September 19th is about... 72-hour kits sent to all school kids in America. Right. And being shipped immediately. Okay, now that's about reason to have great concern. We're sitting here waiting on a lot of things to happen, but now we're talking about something that, that uh, I don't know. Can you give me more information on that? Is that confirmed, denied? Well, 
Uh, okay, um, I can weigh in on this. I'm uh, pretty sure it is confirmed about the three-day packs to the kids. I know that they're being delivered. Yes. Now, go ahead. You go ahead and we have weigh in with, 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 with what you got. Speculation on, as to, okay, uh, are you familiar with the FEMA Region 3 being a staging area for some kind of event that's happening? Have you heard about that? Uh, vaguely, yes. Okay, we have uh, a lot of... And we had Janet Napolitano, before she uh, resigned, giving a statement uh, about a potential humongous disaster, an unprecedented natural disaster. They are preparing for something. Uh, to what we've heard speculation of many different things, from uh, an East Coast tidal wave event to a biological hazard. But I can tell you that there are three-day packs being delivered to students Three day survival packs. In right. other words, yeah, uh, food, water, you know, uh, provisions to last three days. And, and, I, and I try to I try to confirm this locally, and I was unable to do so. And it wasn't because the information is inaccurate. It was because of um, the policy of the school district not to comment on the operations on their operations in, with respect to the security of the students, which I thought was an interesting excuse. But I could tell you this, um, enough people have confirmed that those packs have been sent out to different areas of the country. So, it, we, yes, I mean, it, it, is it true? Um, yes. Is it geographically specific? As far as I could tell, it's, it's not geographically specific. And what's it for? Well, hmm, I don't know. <laughs> Have I helped? Kind <laughs> of. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's hard. I, I mean, I, there's a few dates being thrown around out there. October yeah. 1st, October 24th. Um, some say martial law. Some say economic collapse. And we know that there's something big that's coming on the horizon but i mean it's with all the speculation out there but it's prudent to have that on hand well in general right but when we see the time that it's coming with the talk of all these different things happening um to give you an an update too i don't know if you saw this on steve quail's site there is an uh, alert from today talking about puerto rico uh body bags coffins and it talks about someone receiving a report stating that body bags and supplies are being shipped to Puerto Rico. These reports have been confirmed by military and medical insiders. The government of Puerto Rico denied the report at first, but then redacted it. Uh, Many people from Puerto Rico, apparently folks on the island, are starting to freak out. This is from an individual sending this. They say that uh, one of the co-workers approached them, asking them if they knew anything about a meteor that was going to hit the Atlantic and create a 200-foot tsunami. Um, And it continues from there, but... These are the kind of reports that we're seeing. We're seeing a lot of comet ice on talk. We're seeing a lot of, and one thing I can confirm is the increase in meteors that are entering our atmosphere that are not being reported on at all by any news organizations. Now, whether those two are uh, related, yeah, related or not, there is definitely an increase in a hazardous object coming in from space. Caller, do you have kids in, in school? I do, and uh, I do, Doug. Okay. All right, because I would be very concerned about this. Are, are they, is the school close to where you live? And I don't know how many children you have. You don't have to be specific, but are, is it like around the corner from you? Is it within a mile from you, the schools? Well, uh, it is, and I've been like-minded for quite some time to stay in a very small circle, primarily because I'm in a very, very congested area in Texas that, uh, you know, I just figure I'd rather be with my family than run off to a smaller area. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. You I know, do. it's life worth living versus, you know, you know, going to a remote area where the people I love are not. So uh, I love it. I love knowing it. That, yep. yep. There you go. Knowing that, though, I, I keep my circle really small. I mean, I could walk to my children's school, and that's my mind. And I just got a job 
in the school district. I live in, uh, uh, I'm in a very good school district. Uh, but they just hired me for a pretty low ranking job, which is perfect for what I need. And it's a little further away than I'd like. As if you were to be on foot, it's 11 minutes in a car. I think I'm going to put a bike or some roller skates in my car because that's the way my mind works. What I did in hearing this, my first thought was, huh? And it took me about a day to say, absolutely not. I don't watch TV, so, you know, there's a lot I don't know. But what I did today was contact the superintendent, the food services, because it's out of the USDA, uh, health and Human Services, the head of the medical department, communications and PR, and another person. I don't want to get too uh, just spam them on day one, but I'm I'm kind of a you know I can go there if they if, I, if someone doesn't reply, asking them and sending them the link and posting what's in the link and saying, as a parent, I'm concerned. Would you please confirm or deny? Because my thought is. You know, if if you're protecting my kids, I can see why it's prudent. But if you're protecting my kids, then bring me into the conversation any Absolutely. way you want to and yep. tell me, okay, so if this happens, what are we going to do? If this happens, what are we going to do? You know, bring me into it because I have the same idea. What are we going to do if something goes wrong? Unless, you know, so I'm kind of surprised and I don't know what to think. Any, What would you recommend past that? Well, just that, I, I think doing what you're doing, if, if I had children right now, if, if, if I had children in the school district right now, I would personally go talk to the superintendent of schools and, and ask what the plans are. And I'd, I'd flat out tell the superintendent, look, you're not locking my child in a school for three hours, let alone three days. I don't care what the uh, you know what the situation is. It's my child. It's gonna she, he or she is gonna be home with me. Now that that's how I would kind of start the conversation. Or well, I, I'm not sure. I, I would make sure that they understand that. But I would definitely really root out the cause and what the, their plans are. Are you gonna lock the school down for a hurricane? You gonna lock the school down for a tornado? You gonna lock the school down? You know, I, whether are things I can understand. But what about the uh, um, oh, I don't know, uh, civil unrest or something nebulous. That's something totally different. I, I would definitely find out what I could. Uh, um, I would ask a lot of questions and make sure that they know that if something does happen, I'm coming for my children and you are going to release them to me. Um, That's why we got to stay diligent here and you know be very aware of what's going on in order to uh, no, and, and the times such as these that we live in where we know something on the horizon is more than likely going to happen sooner than later to you know, know when to keep our, our kids in school and out of school. And obviously, if they go to school and something happens, that is uh, something out of our control. But we've seen them take children in busloads to stadiums for uh, disaster drills. And you know the parents couldn't pick them up till a certain time. So... It's something that is very serious, yet at the same time, we have that element of surprise that we just don't know what's going to happen or how it's going to happen. And, and the only other thing I want to th throw in here, ma'am, is, is uh, if you have a chance, go, go to HomelandSecurityUS.com, click on upcoming shows, and click on the link to Paul McGuire. He's got a video about our children there. A little upsetting, but gives you some insight into what's taking place with our children nationwide. Um, but but specifically, uh, getting back to your specifics, uh, go ahead and uh, finish your thought that I, I so badly interrupted. Well, her. I will look at that. No, no, you're fine. Uh, I will look up the Paul McGuire show because, um, you know, I don't have enough force. You know, I'm going to talk big and my thoughts are big and I'm pretty big on the inside but uh, and the outside. <laughs> 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 but, but, <laughs> but honestly, you know, except God be with his people, I have no force to, you know, we, they just added one of the largest police departments in Texas to our yeah. school district. And, uh, you know, so, you know, concerned mom's going to, you know, except God opened that door, you're, we're in for some trouble. And so, 
And well, that's the thing. Do we just keep sending them to school and going to work and hoping it's not today? I mean, whew. No, you keep doing what you're doing, but uh, prepare. You know, expect normalcy, but prepare for abnormal events to take place. If you're mentally and physically and spiritually prepared for something to happen, that's the most that you can hope for. You know, and, and you're going to have to use discernment in how to act when the time comes, whatever that might be. All right. Thank you. Thank y'all both. And uh, of, of little help that we provided. Uh, sorry about that, but uh, we can we can confirm that report about the uh, uh, about the provisions being sent. Beyond that, uh, it it's it's kind of we're, we're uncertain as to what what to expect precisely. Well, I sure hope that you know that it stirs up the topic and the thoughts that you know other people can also go knock on the doors of their school district and find out you know. You know, it's, you know, what we can do and be a voice. That's, that's right. I guess, right? That's right. That's, that's, you're exactly right, okay. and, and we love it. Thank you so much for your call. God bless you. And, and if you do find out any information, give us a call back and let, let us know what you find out. I will. All okay. Right. Thank God you. bless. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. All right. <laughs> and, and, you know, Joe, some topics, especially when, when dealing with children, they deserve it deserves extra time it deserves extra diligence it deserves extra uh attention because uh, the most important assets in our lives aside from our spouses right and there's uh you know these three day emergency packs for for students i know that they are confirmed we have you know drills coming up that uh, electric or 2013, the National Grid, right. November 13th and 14th. I saw conflicting reports on these. One said no actual, um, you know, this will be a simulation. No power outage will happen. And then I've seen articles that say, you know, stock up on food and toilet paper and water. But what good is, uh, you know, st refrigerated food going to do you if your refrigerator doesn't work? But. Anyway, we're going to move on to 714 next. You're live on the Hagman and Hagman Report. What is on your mind tonight? Uh, hi, guys. Uh, first of all, uh, my name is Brighton, and uh, just wanted to thank you guys for what you guys do. Well, thank hi, you. Um, my, uh, my question is basically with the blatancy and immunity that the government seems to be operating um, Obviously, like-minded people, you know, we, that are paying attention. I mean, it just seems almost uh, absurd, you know, with what they seem to be getting away with, and with you know the coming uh, what's on the horizon. Uh, it just seems that you know what what how much more uh, ready could you know I'm 28. How, how much more ready could my peers be to be you know deceived with? Uh, you know, not even being aware of what's going on in politics, hardly knowing why they love Obama, just that they love him. And I spent a lot of time with uh, David Flynn towards the end of his life, just speaking about, you know, what he thought might, you know, be the scenario. Um, and I, I just, I just can't believe, you know, how, how dumbed down and, and how prime, you know, the population is. Seemingly, you know, for what's coming. You're okay, David Flynn of who are we uh, speaking about? Uh, the, the author, David Flynn. That's who I thought. Okay, interesting. And yeah, you're 28. I, I, okay. you know, he lived with me towards towards the end of uh, of his life, and you know, I, me and some of my close friends just tried to rack his brain as much, you know about his thoughts of, you know, the times and, and what was, was, you know, possibly going to happen. And, you know, it seems with each scandal just coming and going and being forgotten, uh, you know, it's almost as if, you know, do you think the government's almost just, you know, seeing how much they can get away with and, you know, just, you know, feeling us out and just going, wow, you know, <laughs> you know, it's almost like no one, no one I know even understands what Benghazi even means, you know, let alone... You know. No, a lot. I mean, you're right. A lot of what they do, they do to gauge public reaction. They look for what will provoke somebody, what will make somebody 
step out of their comfort zone for whatever reason and they gauge the responses to know how to react to them when the real thing happens. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, just you, trying to open... And, I'm sorry. No, no. Um, I, I'm just curious of what you thought of David Flynn. What's my thought of him? Yeah, I mean, what, what did he share with you toward the end of his life? Oh, gosh. You know, we spoke a lot about... Um, you know, his research on, on the uh, uh, temple at the center of time and, and things like that and, and multiple scenarios. But I, you know, believe one of the prime, you know, things was that, uh, you know, the idea of extraterrestrials, you know, seeding life here on the planet and, you know, um, with, with all of that, you know, uh, you know, being a, a possible great deception to, uh, you know, take believers away from, you know, the faith and, and right. things like that. Right, okay, because I, I know Steve, uh, with Steve Quell, uh, David Flynn connection, um, you, you know, it, it's, uh, sadly, he passed away in 2012, I, I believe, wasn't it 2012? Uh, yeah. Okay, all yeah. right. Well, they yeah. are, from what I understand. Well, you know, just, go ahead, Paul. Go ahead, go ahead. Well, it was just, um, just seemingly, you know, I, we don't watch much TV, you know, mostly get our information from um, independent news like like yourself and, and things like that. And um, it, it just, it seems that, you know, my grandfather spent his whole life trying to change, you know, policy and write to senators and try and make things happen. And being a believer, you know, that always just seemed, you know, like a futile fight. It'd be more important to, you know, lead others to, you know, the truth and the gospel and, and things like that. Um, and it's just, I, I'm sorry, it's, I guess it's a vague question of just how far, you know, realizing how far everyone, especially my peer group, is from, you know, the truth and and trying to open their eyes and, and not come off as, you know, they always bring up the word conspiracy theorists and this and that. And, you know, when you see just the government blatantly, you know, just scandal after scandal and seeming to get, you know, this immunity and, and being above, you know, any type of motions for impeachment or, or, and, you know, that's just on a political scale, just, just the deception, you know, above us is just. Yeah, it's, the deception is incredible. We can't get answers about anything. Everything that's coming out of the government's a lie. And, you know, it's, it's so blatant right now. It's telling us, at least it's telling me, uh, folks, that the time is short. You know, the more open the uh, they are, the, the more open, openly, um, what would you call it? The openly uh, uh, lying openly, I suppose. It, it tells us the time is short. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't think we, I don't think we can read any more, anything different than that. But we've got to look at this, and, and, and we've got to we've got to go beyond this. And you know, I, I I wrestled with this myself, and Joe and I have talked about this. How much time do you do you spend in trying to educate people that refuse to be educated? I really think that in the end they're going to come to you with their questions and say, "What just happened? And what's going to happen?" And they're going to look to you for leadership, which is why I believe that everyone listening to this program today was born for this place this moment in time and you're you're at the exact location where you're supposed to be where god wants you to be if you have opened your heart to listen to the word and i believe that to be the case so i believe you are the leader among your peers or your sphere of influence and that goes for everyone listening to this program thank you very much and well, thank you well god bless you. god bless you god man. bless you too thanks for the call that would be an interesting, uh, Joe, that'd be interesting to live with David Flynn, uh, and a very interesting uh, man. Um, I, I never spoke to him. I don't know him personally, but he did pass away from, I believe it was uh, brain cancer, a very, very aggressive brain cancer back in 2012. He was... Yeah, I think I remember um, in, hearing about that. In fact, I, I believe... Um, uh, I'm not. I'm not certain if 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 Steve is actually sells David Flynn's books, or I think he's got one or two books. So I'm not sure who sells them. I I just saw it the other day too, and it reminded me of it. But nonetheless, 
go ahead. We don't screen calls, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, we do give you the opportunity to, the opportunity to talk and speak up about what's on your mind, which is different than other talk shows. We are going to 484 next. Thanks for holding. You're live on the Hagman and Hagman Report. Hi, Doug and Joe. How are you guys doing tonight? Not too bad. Excellent. Getting, getting over my anger issues thanks to a Nerf, nerf map. <laughs> Not yet, not yet, not yet. I tell you. <laughs> oh, okay. I haven't spoke to you guys. I haven't spoke to you guys in quite a while. Um, you mad at us? It's, <laughs> I can't even remember. I can't even remember how long ago it is. But but uh, my wife works for the Internal Revenue Service in the field, and um, I won't get specific more specific than that. She, she's not but, coming to my house, is she? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, no, actually, she doesn't do that. She's uh, she's not that type of IRS person. Okay, uh, you you might consider it more like a uh, almost like a desk job type of thing. Gotcha. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, believe me, uh, uh, everybody that works for the IRS uh, is part of the problem, not part of the solution. <laughs> However, um, is your wife on the line? They were. No, Did she, she hear that? No, she's not anywhere close. Cause <laughs> I, I wouldn't be able to do this. Uh, but she probably she will probably listen to this uh, later on because she likes hearing what I say to you guys, and and uh, and then you usually makes her comments. Um, All right, well, we'll f- fire us up because uh, now I'm getting ready. Go ahead. Uh, well, Friday, early Friday, uh, they were all her group uh, and. She said there were more people in the room than she'd ever seen before in any meetings that they had had. They had all of their managers there. They had all their supervisors there. All the field people, it was a mandatory meeting. It was a call, an emergency phone call that said, hey, you've got a mandatory meeting in 30 minutes, get there, kind of thing. Uh, They had a union rep there. Um, The gist of it was that they said, as of October 1st, they're going to furlough everyone in the government. Now, after speaking with her, I tried to clarify the everyone in the government kind of thing because, to me, everyone in the government is a really big bunch of people that do a lot of different jobs that are pretty significant. So I said, well, you know, what about the DHS guys? What about the guys at the airport? She goes, yeah, airlines are going to be affected. Now, before I go any further, please, everyone take this with a grain of salt because this is kind of fluid because there are things that had happened after the meeting that may have changed that. And I'll, and I'll cover that in a second. Um, the person that was, uh, the manager that was presenting this, they passed out forms for them all to sign. Everyone had to sign a form, which was basically um, not a release, but it was, she didn't get real specific, but it was kind of like it was a statement that said they were all going to do this because the gist of the meeting was they were going to do this to defund Obamacare. They were going to, uh, based on what was asked in the Senate, they want to try and defund Obamacare. That's what they were telling them. Um, I told her I thought that was bogus. I said, Chris, first of all, if you're if you take everyone in the government and you put them on a furlough for three weeks, which is about what this is supposed to be, I said, you're not taking away money from the government. What you're doing is you're giving them everybody's paycheck that they don't have to pay. So you haven't cost them any money. You've made them money, in my opinion. Now, I could be wrong, but that's what it sounds like to me. So she said, like, people like the post office was not affected by this. Um, Some very essential uh, groups of people would not be affected, but there were just very few of those. Now, having I have prior service uh, in the military, so I've seen the government shutdown thing about the first of October. I don't, I can't even count how many times because of budgetary constraints and new new policies and all kinds of crap that goes on that kind of covers that. And then they usually vote on they vote on a new uh, budget or something, and they oh yeah, it's just something to get people cranked up. But this one's this one is a little different because uh, I've known her for for about 15 years now, and they've never done anything like this. Never, they've never had that many people in one place. Um, 
the things that are happening with her specifically and her group specifically, uh, they were not classified as agents before. Um, the IRS is changing that. Now they are all considered federal agents. And that's under the federal health. Right. And, and that's, as I understand it, that's an artifact or a consequence of the, shall we say, Obamacare. Right. It, right. Um, and, I, and I agree with that. In a twisted sort of way. But go ahead. I mean, not that I agree with what they're doing, but I, but I agree with your statement that that's, that is the cause that they were going to want them to do certain things that, you know, quite frankly, I can't see her uh, doing whether it be voluntarily or, or because she's being paid to do it. She's not that type of person. Um, it's, it's, just, it's just a job for her, but unfortunately, uh, it's really starting to weigh on her heavy about what's going on. Because when she, it didn't really weigh on her before, I think, the middle of last month, when they told them they were going to issue them firearms. Um, she's, she's not an anti-gun person, but... Um, she's not a very large gun person. She doesn't go out and shoot all the time and those kinds of things. Shot when she was younger, but not, not recently, and she doesn't own a firearm by choice. But doesn't care if anybody else does. Um, and, and it's definitely not against it. Uh, originally, the, the word Glock was tossed around um, because of the government buying all those rounds of forty caliber. But when she came home from a meeting about three weeks ago, she had mentioned that uh, something about Colt. She had mentioned the word Colt. I've been into firearms since I was eight years old. So I said, well, Glock and Colt are two different types of firearms. They said so, and I tried to probing her for, you know, maybe a number. What, what, what would Colt make that you guys would be carrying? And she said 1311. I said, you mean 1911? She goes, yeah, that's it. And I started wondering why would the government, especially the IRS, be issuing 1911 Colts to the to their agents? So I don't know if it's solid information um, because I don't know. You know, numbers go through her head all the time, so I don't know how solid that is. But it didn't make 100 percent sense. Um, it, it would make more sense if she said, "Yeah, it was a Glock 19 or whatever the model is for 40 caliber." That would make more sense, but not forty-five or or even a nineteen eleven. But uh, but are you saying that this relates to the are you, are the issuance of firearms? Does this have any direct correlation to the October first um, alleged shutdown of everything, or is it two separate issues? Well, maybe it, maybe I'm well, I'm convoluting the the situation here. The the firearms issuance came first. Friday's meeting was an emergency meeting, and, and there was no indications up to that point of anything on October 1st. At that point, there was a, the statements that were made um, concerning specifically Obamacare, concerning the, the, the form that they had to sign, everyone in the room signed it, that they were willing to give up their, you know, two or three weeks or whatever it was of, of working, basically, to help defund Obamacare. And that was what she said specifically. Um, the firearms issue was more so that uh, I found it odd that in her position that she's issued a firearm because of her job, what she does. Um, doesn't involve any of that. She works solely by herself. She doesn't work going out to a person and saying, hey, show me all your stuff. That's not how she does what she does. It's more like a, it's, uh, it's more like an office worker right. uh, in that respect. So it's very odd. Um, but they have been issued raid jackets that say federal agent on the back. Um, they have, uh, which, which really shocked her because it was all kind of a, oh, pie in the sky thing up to that point when she walked in and they said, here, here's your raid jacket, and it's got federal agent on the back and the IRS symbol on the front. That was a shock for her. And then now, you, that, really that's verified. The, the you, body you, armor. Yeah, the, 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 the body armor. With the federal agent on the back, you you can absolutely one hundred percent verify that, right? Yes, yes. Folks, listen um, to this caller. Folks, listen to this caller. That should speak volumes. Okay. 
Now, the, the other... I wanted to... Go, go ahead. On, go ahead. No, no, please continue. Well, I was, I was tossing this around. I, I listened on Saturday. Unfortunately, I listened to you on, on YouTube for the most part because of my time schedule. So I listened to the Tom Horn uh, um, show that you had, and, and it was a great show. Your shows are usually pretty good um, for the most part when I listen to them. So uh, I've been tossing this around. Who who do I contact? I was going to send, send Steve Quayle an email and say, hey, Steve, you know, uh, I don't know how to take this for, with a grain of salt, but maybe do some double-checking on other sources that may have had this same thing happen. Uh, just to verify it, you know, because I get one angle of this, and having been where I've been and done what I've done um, in the pla- in the past, um, I try to dig a little deeper with with this person to find out is the information that they have makes sense in how it rolls out, and um, and based on everything else that's going on, the news that we're hearing from a lot of different sources about the the first of October. Um, Steve Quayle has things on his uh, on his alerts page about uh, the military being called back uh, right. to duty today, specifically uh, the 23rd of September. Right. Um, you've got Common Eisen, which is now close enough to start actually doing some things to affect what's going on around us electrically. If you talk to James McCanny, uh, Professor McCanny, um, and and that whole thing's supposed to happen between the 13th and 15th of November which is about the time they're running the electrical drill for, you know, the, the government shutting down the electrical grid, um, which I'm still, I'm not sure if they're actually going to turn the lights off or if it's just, well, we're going to we're gonna play like we did, if it's a scenario yeah. thing. <laughs> I'm trying to figure um, that out I myself. I haven't got any real confirmation on that. Yeah, yeah. So it's, yeah. It's like, you know, you turn a power off on a nuclear power station, it's going to take a little while to turn it back on, you know, and and, and that's a whole different a whole different thing, but I've heard a lot of stories. Um, you had Sharon on from Texas just a few minutes ago who was worried about her children and, and, the, and the 72-hour kids right. going to their families. Um, my kids are all grown, so I don't have to worry about that. And, and I'm not, I, I was in Texas for a while, and, and uh, um, I came from south of Fort Worth. It's a beautiful, beautiful place, beautiful people, awesome people. I love the people in Texas. And, you know, my only suggestion is talk to your kids. And have a family plan. This is what a family's going to do so your kids would know if, if I can get out of this, where do I go? What do I do next? Because they're just going to look to an adult for, they don't know. They don't know what to right. expect. Um, and pray about it. Oh, my God, pray about it. But um, yeah. the, the only thing I would add to and, this, right. the, the one thing I would caution people about is, you know, dates are thrown around so, so frequently. If not... Nothing happens on October 1st, and nothing happens on November 13th or 14th, and nothing of significance that is. Uh, people have a tendency to, to say, see, you know, you guys are so full of hot air. Actually, worse than that, but, you know, it, it's you let your guard down at that point. However, I don't like to really speak about dates. We know something is coming. Um, we should look at uh, events and conditions as opposed to dates. And is it the right time, or does it feel like the right time, or are there signs to point us to the right time? But you know, keep the dates in the back of your mind. Uh, however, what you said with the meeting, for example, uh, October 1st is a pretty hard date with with respect to your your wife's meeting, was it not? I mean, that, that was... Yeah. Uh, you know, so, okay, that that is something totally different. Now... I would I would uh, equate that with the uh, alleged or potential shutdown of the federal government, the threats of the uh, shutdown. However, which with what you said, of course, makes it a little bit more uh, a little bit different than previous years, previous instances. Hmm. Uh, it it was to me. It, it would. You know, having been in the government for 12 years, you know, I got used to how the government was really slow on things. Um, yeah. You know how just, you know, try and go get a driver's license. So when they get a phone call, and, and I dealt with her and, and the people she's dealt with and, and going through all this kind of stuff for 15 years. When she gets a phone call and says, you know, the person on the other line says, you've got a meeting at this time, 
especially over the last, oh, I'd say over the last six months or so, she doesn't get any of these emergency calls, but she gets calls and say, hey, we've got a meeting on Friday, or we've got a meeting next week, uh, those types of things. She'll get a call like that. Yeah, your she typical doesn't deal stuff. with people face to face every day. Yeah, yeah. Right. So when she gets a call and they say, "Be here now," um, that doesn't happen. And when she told me, she actually woke me up to tell me when she got home from the meeting because I didn't know she was gone. I was sleeping. Um, she was disturbed with what was going on, and, and the and she was trying to put a lot of it together. So, hmm. you know. No, please take it with a grain of salt. Uh, I don't. I, I I can confirm some of the things because uh, you know, a I know her, but you know, but visuals make a big deal, and so like the firearms thing, I can't I can't confirm that hard. I don't know for sure because it was supposed to be August and it didn't happen, and now it's September, middle of September, and I'm thinking, you know, well, maybe this wasn't going to happen. Or actually, it's the end of September, isn't it? So the first of October is next week, and right. that's you know it's the new it's the start of the new fiscal year. That's that's what clicked in in my head when they said first of October, and it's like, well, how many times have they done this? You know, they're trying to push for money or or whatever, but this is a little different circumstance. So I kind of look at that, and and I've heard the you know FEMA wanted a whole bunch of stuff delivered by October first with open ended contracts and. Right. You know, FEMA Region 3, well, I'm in FEMA Region 3. So, you know, everything that goes on in FEMA Region 3, I'm going to start throwing up red flags for and really scrutinizing. You know, from, from the D.C. shooter event that went on uh, last week through through everything else that goes on in this area, because it, it may directly or indirectly affect me quicker than than most anybody else. And as as somebody who's who knows somebody directly, that works in the government, and, and and your listeners don't know me from Adam. You know, I'm just a voice on the radio, so you know they could say, "Ah, oh, well, this guy's full of beans." You know, check it out for yourself. Exactly. You know, to start doing some research, and I and I wouldn't stick on YouTube, although I I do look at YouTube a lot. But there's places, there's sources I trust, and sources I don't, and and all that has to do with confirmation of going through government websites and confirming. You know, yes, here's this form that person said was there and reading it and, and line by line because some people can twist that a little bit. It's like, oh, well, that doesn't really say that. And But, you know, the coffins, I haven't seen coffins or body bags yet or, or you know, train cars sitting on side tracks and things like that yet. And so I, I haven't seen any drones, um, although I have trained her now to start listening for specific types of helicopters that fly over because of my experience with uh, the Black Hawk series um, helicopters, the, the okay. um, gosh, you name it, the Kiowas, the the, the uh, D five hundred Qs, um, a lot of different the Bell Jet Rangers, so that I can say this is what this one sounds like. Oh no, that's a medical helicopter, and we'll go look at it. Maybe it's an Alouette or one of those other types. So you know, she so she'll understand that there's different tones and different things, and this is. This one will sound, and this is the black helicopter. You know, I've seen the black hel- helicopter in the airport or flying to the airport uh, in the area that I'm at. So I know they're here, um, but I haven't really got a solid uh, thing for any any drones in my area yet. And I keep my eyes open pretty close. If there's, uh, I've seen a lot of the uh, shipping containers at, you know, maybe like in a parking lot next to a restaurant or something, and I think it's kind of odd and out of place. They just happen to be tan, and why is that? You know, and, <laughs> and I look for any, you know, any. Well, is that a military number style that they use because they do it a certain way? You know, right. and is it, is it that, or or are they just doing construction again? You know, uh, so there's those kinds of things in the back of my head. And uh, well, there's a National Guard armory not very far from from where I'm at that. They had a lot of vehicles in, and all of a sudden they're gone. Well, not all of a sudden. They've been gone for about uh, three months or four months now. They're just completely cleaned out. So I'm waiting for that one to start showing them activity. Hmm. Um, there's another one where about two weeks ago or so, um, she was called in to do some work, and she said there was a bunch of guys there with a bunch of stuff all over the place. Um, What's that mean? all their gear. 
Y- you mean? Well, uh, they were. It, w- it was in the middle of the week. It was on a Wednesday, um, and they were getting the National Guard guys together, um, and they were doing something large. Whatever okay, large. with with their one hundred and fifty people with their military with gear. Their okay, all right. right. With their packs, I confirmed that with their packs or. You know, what was it, big trucks or stuff? She said it was with all their personal stuff, their, their packs, their big, because I have uh, some of those things. So okay. she'll, she'll say, you know, you know your, your rucksack and your, that kind of stuff. Right. And it's like, oh, okay. So, but it was the fact that we're usually when she uh, sees this place, there's not that many people. There's two or three people at the most. But this time she said there was probably 150 people there. So, and on a Wednesday, it doesn't make any sense to me for uh, either the, the, the uh, monthly or the annual um, drill. Now, I don't know for sure because I was never a reserve, but I know a lot of reservists, and, you know, I've talked to a couple of those guys, and they're kind of like, well, you know, it's it could be, and it could be this, and it could be that. So I can't even really, i just kind of throwing that out there for people to keep an eye on stuff like that. To, you know, a lot of dogs. Any large troop movements. Yeah, you've, right. you've tossed out a lot of dots, a, a couple of pretty significant dots. Uh, your wife, the body armor, the talk about the guns, the, the October 1st potential shutdown, um, and, and then the anecdotal evidence, the rest uh, being anecdotal uh, evidence or, or the smaller dots. So we've got, to, we've got to really kind of pay attention to what's going on. Look, uh, we're in re, uh, Region 3, FEMA Region 3. Uh, we have photographs of drones flying over one of the interstates at, at a relatively low level, and we could, you know, identify them as drones, but based on the on the uh, video imagery. So, uh, you know, th- things are happening. I mean, it's what though is the question exactly with precision? What is it? I think from my from my perspective, um, and I get asked this, she asks me, um, and a couple of people at work ask me, and some other friends and things, they ask me, these things, well, well, you know, should we prepare for this or should we prepare for that? Um, having been where I've been, done what I've done, all you can do is mentally prepare your, yourself for, um, I hate to say for anything, but but work through the scenarios in your head. What would I do if? What would I do if? It's this. It's the surprise, and I don't have a plan. You know, if I if I'm out driving, do I have my bug out bag with me? Do I have, you know, what what supplies do I have? If I'm sitting here and all of a sudden the car breaks down, what do you do when the car breaks down? You don't have your cell phone. Okay, what's the next step? Because I, for a long time, I didn't have a cell phone, and I had to deal with it anyway. So, you know, to for me to mentally prepare for. Uh, a meteor strike or, you know, a tsunami that hits New Jersey or, or, you know, just name the things that go down the list. What if, what if I roll up and, and there's a, uh, oh, I don't know, a DHS checkpoint. What do I do? Well, I do what I've got to do. I just, I go through it and, you know, do I have anything that they're probably going to want to, you know, really get sideways over? They might say something about my bug out bag or, I don't know, my tire pressure. Who knows these days? So it's preparing yourself mentally, certainly get right with God. Um, that's, that's the first step. Pray about it. You know, and like Steve says, that's, to me, everything, that's the first place you go. Then it's, you know, shelter. If you're caught out in the middle of the wind, in the middle of winter, do you have something to shelter yourself from that, from that harsh? Because you're not going to last for very long if you don't. Then water, and then food, and then go down the list. But, you know, mentally, I talk to myself. Uh, I talk. Yeah, I do that a lot. But um, I, I talk through scenarios, work through scenarios. What if? Compare them to things that I've done in the past. What would I change if? You know, it's kind of like going to a gun range, and you get that muscle memory where you're still, you're doing the same thing with your brain. You're getting the brain memory of, you know, how do I get home from here? What route would I have to take? Are there any bridges that I would have to cross? How would I cross the river? Is it low point, high point? You know, those kinds of things. Um, as far as, you know, what what can happen with Comet Ison, you know, I watched a couple of comets do a sun dive thing this year uh, on uh, on Soho, Alaska, too. And just before they got 
out of the frame of the picture, uh, a CME shot out towards the comet. This was twice in, within a week, so not, very, not very long ago. So I said, well, that, that tells me right there that it's a potential that when, when ISON does its thing this year, it's going to supposed to do the hook around the sun, it's very possible that, or, or I should say it's, it's plausible to me, that, and I agree with you know Professor McCanny and Stan Dale and, and everybody else that's the experts that know more about this than I do, just, that it could possibly cause an electrical eruption of some type that would send some kind of thing our way. And what do you do then? Uh, well, if you if you wake up on the other side of it, you'll have to figure it out. If if you're if you're not prepared mentally, uh, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, if you're at least prepared mentally and you know how to make fire if you have to, or make a water filter if you have to, or at least strain water. How you know what to boil it in if you have stuff. Think about the people that had to go through uh, that hurricane last year that hit uh, Sandy. Yeah. Hurricane Sandy hit New Jersey and New York and all those people. What did those people do? I mean, uh, I saw a lot of debris sitting around there. I mean, what would you have done with that debris? Walk yourself through that scenario. Go back through some of those videos and say, well, there's a tin can right there. I could have, uh, you know, I could have cleaned that out and boiled water in it so I'd have water. Or I could have made a, you know, this or that. I mean, MacGyver stuff. Figure it out. 90 uh, seconds. Know, not, Absolutely. There's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of information out there. Um, and like you, know, you said, uh, uh, being mentally prepared is something that we uh, must do now while we still can, uh, while there's still a semblance of reality here because things will get a lot worse and how many of us will be prepared to handle it when that time comes. Uh, you took us to the end of the show, caller. We're going to have to let you go. God bless you. I want to thank you for your call and your information. seconds. Great, guys. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, take care of yourselves. Thank you. You take care as well. Folks, we're up against the end of the program already. What a fast show it was with uh, our special guest, Mark Mitchell, uh, in the second hour. And tomorrow, Stan Dale, be sure to be here at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. And we will have Stan Dale tomorrow. Paul McGuire, Wednesday. Dr. Jerome Corsi, Thursday. And Yoda on Friday. You're not going to want to miss this week. And once again, for those who joined us late, go back and listen to Wednesday's episode with Nathan Leal. Go back and listen to Friday's episode with Stephen Tom Horn, as Tom Horn gave so much uh, fantastic information in there. I hope we can do a part two to that or have him on again soon because there's so much more we need to get into. But don't seconds. miss this week. And God bless each and every one of you. One last thing. Keep Brother Marcus in your prayers. Uh, I know he is going through some tough spiritual things, so please keep him in your prayers, and God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow. Have a great night.